We're live. Cheers. Cheers. I was thinking when I've been going through Snorres Edda. You want to start there? I want to start there. With Snorres Edda? Just to start there. What, what okay. kind of sources can we trust? And we want to, in this episode of what, we'll, we'll see how many episodes we make, um, to start a little bit with what he says, because it's it's so concrete that you start wondering. Yeah. When he talks about the gods, yeah. the Asir, uh-huh. and he specifically says that they came from Turkey or Turkland. Turklander. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, he talks about Thor and Odin, com- uh, Thor and, and Siv. Yeah, 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 yeah. Both with golden hair, yeah. living in Turkey. And then the sun after sun after sun, and then you get Odin, and then he comes up north. And yeah. Re- and instates the way of governing a society as they had in Turkland. And I was just wondering, is that is there something to it, or is there is it completely off? So, uh, uh, it's very interesting to approach that right now because there's so much more we can say than only just five years ago. And if you have asked me that question, I would say, well, oh, it's just another theory or so many theories. But what we can now is you can tell a, a different story that more or less coincides in time or in time periods mm. with migrations and mixing of peoples. And, and this is all quite interesting. We, we have to remember first that Eddas, they are not to, to be considered history books, right? They, they were actually books on how to do poetry or how to learn poetry. So a lot of these stories are there for a reason, and that reason is poetry. Uh, not to tell a story of how it exactly was or really was. And when we look at what we now are starting to get a grasp of or, or understand what really happened, yes, they were warriors, and yes, they came to conquer, and they did, in all over Europe. But the reason why uh, something different seems to have been going on in not just Scandinavia, but the Baltic area around the Baltic Sea, is that here the transition was more, uh, it, it wasn't sort of a conqueror people who came and ruled and uh, so many other people died out, like on the British Isles. Uh, we see more of a blend that's happening. Right. We call it the battle axe culture. Uh, at the start of the Nordic Bronze Age. And that, that's when it must have occurred this year. We see it after a huge cat- catastrophe, 4,200 years ago, when the old kingdom in Egypt went down, Mesopotamia, Sumer, uh, all these huge civilizations who were Neolithic, uh, they were um, um, uh, agricultural societies. And even in China, the first Neolithic society there, culture, uh, also vanished because of this huge catastrophe. And that's when we see that things start to merge or blend in around this time period. And that's what we see after every big catastrophe. The same thing happening afterwards, that new peoples or names of groups of peoples start to come. Yeah, well, when you, when you read either of the, the two Eddas, the, the old Edda and the, uh, or Snorri's Edda, you, you get, well, especially in Volvespo, oh. which I guess is told by Volva, uh, a, a sorceress, a, a woman, to Odin. Mm-hmm. Um, and she talks about the whole, uh, whole uh, um, well, Ragnarok, of course, is a major part of it. But she, she suddenly... Or in that story, there's, it's suddenly very clear about this war between yeah. the Vanir and the Asir. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and the, the Asir then, I guess, coming in, right? Or yeah. how, yeah. how is that whole situation? Because so, it's like, can you, can, you, can you date? Yeah, we can now. Snor's ideas to, to when that happened? 
you know, it's so refreshing to do this now in yeah. in in our time right now, because now even archaeologists in Denmark this year has uh, they have come out and and they've stated what what it's been more or less theory, uh, theories uh, earlier on, but because of all this new DNA evidence, we were able to uh, make more uh, well to be more conclusive. And what's interesting in this war you mentioned. In, in Wulespur, there, there, there's not a whole lot of talk about the war itself. The main part is what happens afterwards. Mm. You know, exchange of hostages, how they live together, and and how they would learn from each other, like um, Odin and the Asir would learn sight, the magic that the Vanir had, right? There's one thing Snorri had wrong, because he placed the war prior to the uh, migration to Scandinavia. Uh, but it now, what we see now is that uh, these warriors, the war they had was uh, with uh, farmers or agriculturalists or, or um, people who were in the Neolithic era. Mm. And, and the Valny, uh, no doubt, was in present-day Denmark and, and, and Sweden and Norway, uh, but in the south. And uh, and uh, uh, even archaeologists, as I said, are now stating this. So so we can be more uh, firm when we say that they, they came and then they uh, uh, had this sort of warfare because it was very violent times. We can time this now between two big disasters uh, in the centuries prior to 4,200 years ago. So this is 2.4 BC, 2.4 thousand BC. Really? Uh, sorry, 2.2. 2. Wow. 2. 2. Sorry. Yeah. So, so we call it a, uh, these are these bond events. Uh, and I don't know if you, we've talked about that before in or earlier, but it's natural occurrences of, of climate change every 1500 years about. Mm -hmm. And we know between two of these, they, they're called bond events. And there's one bond event, which is called the 4.2 bond event 4.2 that means k thousand so that means 4200 years ago and so we're talking about the centuries before this mm -hmm. uh, and and we know that because of the bond event that happened prior to that which is the 5.9 k event well that was a huge uh, dry period that each catastrophe is different, right? Some are wet periods and it's different parts in different parts of the world. Uh, 5,900 5, years ago, that's when the Sahara Desert became a desert. It was a huge oh, yeah, yeah. drought period. But what's bad in one area can be good in some other areas, or it depends on how you say good, because, because this drought, uh, the steppes became better suited for riding horses and carriages upon. And then in the Caucasus region, you had the Asir, uh, or at least you have the Indo-European, they're called the Yamnaya now, the Yamnaya warriors. And they had just acquired the technology of the wheel from the Maikop culture, which is a bit further south. And there's a brand new study now that points to the ancestral home of these Indo-European warriors. And they put them south of the Caucasus Mountains, not north that we thought, but they have migrated north from there. And so it's in the Armenian highlands somewhere, probably. And they were in strong contact with the Fertile Crescent, which is further south towards uh, Mesopotamia, uh, because we know they were trade that existed there. And we know they have a very strong um, link with the, the Maikop culture, who had the wheel and the carriages. And then the, after this, huge catastrophe, uh, there was room to conquer, to travel, and because it was decimation of people, right? So a conquering tribe could come. Mm -hmm. And because the steppes are all flat, all into Europe, most of Northern Europe, except for the Carpathian Mountains, they're all, it's all flat, except for Scandinavia. Right. Northern Scandinavia, that is. The Scandinavian Peninsula or Fennoscandia, as we call it, with Finland. Um, so, uh, what we can say now for some degree of certainty is that uh, these warriors, who are in genetics called the Yamnaya warriors, came into Europe. 
they conquered a lot. It was very violent. And uh, a lot of the farming communities, agricultural community, communities, uh, died out or reconquered. A lot of but men those, died out. But those would be the Asir then mythology? Logical. In the north, yes. Yeah. But they also went south, they went to the Iberia, they went to the right. British Isles. They're called the Beaker culture in, in the, on the British Isles. Yeah. But what about this idea that, that I mean, uh, is Snorri completely off when he talks about how the Odin and these uh, more or less escaped from the Roman uh, uh, roamings <laughs> in the area? Because that's much later than what you're talking about now. Yeah, yeah. So we do yeah. have depictions of, of Odin at that time also. You know, it's, yeah. it's quite, this is a little bit frustrating, but that's... I think yeah, because in that ser TV series that you mentioned, yes. the, 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 the archaeologist Enigma title. Odin or something like that would, would be in English. In, yeah, Enigma, yeah, yeah, the riddle, yeah, Odin's riddle. Yeah, I think it then is. they say, oh, we are now able to date him all the way back to the 5th century uh, AD. AD, yeah. yeah. But that's, they're searching for something there, and we'll get to that, I know uh, that. It's about uh, Attila and the Huns, right? But what we see in the Nordic uh, Bronze Age, so that's 2,000 years earlier. That's when this mix started. That's, mm. And they, they came even before that, right? They came 3,000 years before um, what you're talking about with Attila and the Huns. Yeah. That's when they came into Scandinavia. So we have three huge crises, uh, great catastrophes that Snorre, he wrote about things that happened before these three catastrophes. And each of these catastrophes happened about 1,500 years, every 1,500 years backwards in time. So Snorri wrote this stuff down in the 13th century, early 13th century. And, and he wrote it about poetry, right? Not to tell the story as it was. He was trying to remember stories that were from the first catastrophe to him that happened 700 years earlier, which was in yeah, the yeah. 6th century. Yeah. And then there was the Bronze Age collapse, and then it was before the Nordic Bronze Age, which is the 4.2K event, even before that. So you have to remember, you have to try to see through these catastrophes, right? But do we know that these ideas or these mythical figures go all the way back to before 4,200 years ago? Well, that's the thing. Uh, we, we know that um, Odin is probably very old but there was also some sort of odin worship in the sixth century fifth century and in the iron age mm. which differs maybe and maybe we're talking about several things that have merged together mm. we see it with um this um vanir god called njord right uh who w was in the iron age a male god but the same god was actually a fertility, fertility goddess yeah. in the Bronze Age, right? So it's, it changed gender, it became, because the society was much more uh, masculine, I guess, or much more warrior driven in a sense. But this blend in the Bronze Age, yeah, uh, it's, it's very interesting to see. And, and what we now are starting to see is that these, there was a blend of three different peoples in Scandinavia. And this blend occurred because of mountains and the far north. They were able to survive and withstand the onslaught in other ways than on the British Isles, for example. But is, it, is this then reflected in that uh, sort of tripartite uh, uh, division between the Jotnir and the Aesir and the Vanir? Exactly. The Jotnir were much more to the north. Because yeah. they are described at least partially as quite large. Yes. Right? But and, not and they were tall. They were tall. Yeah. Yeah. We know that from the from the sources also, that they were as tall as today. But also the, the Yamnaya warriors were tall. We know that also. And they had similar ancestors. And they're even further back in time. So so there are some And again those would be the Asir in this yes. equation. But, but but before that even they're called ancient north Eurasians, A N E, Ana. Hmm. And, and so they had, there was something there uh, like 10,000 years ago. Yeah. So if you look at the, it depends on how wide we're going to look at this. What we know is that all these three people, three different groups of peoples, 
uh, the warriors and the farmers and the hunter-gatherers, the Scandinavian hunter-gatherers, they would mix. And that's what the first part of the Nordic Bronze Age is. Mm. And Scandinavian hunter-gatherers, again, that would be the Vanir? The Jotnir. The, that would be yeah. the Jotnir. Okay. Because the Vanir, we know they were agricultural. Right. And, and, and they had their base in southern Scandinavia. Uh, but after the warriors came, they moved into Sweden. And that's where today you find the highest concentration, if you look on the genetics, of the um, I, haplogroup I1, it's called. It's the one where you can measure, see how far your family heritage go, right? It's the same as I have. Uh, but um, it depends on the farmers. Uh, something happened in Sweden. They were able to withstand uh, these warriors and, and uh, they have mixed. And also eventually the Scandinavian hunter-gatherers further north would mix. And what we see, I think we can even date it even more now because 3,600 years ago, there was a new study that came now that talked about this. Uh, it's, this is in the middle of, not the Bronze Age, but the Nordic, the, uh, the Nordic Bronze Age, which is Scandinavia and the Baltic. And around 1600 BC, so 3,600 years ago, we see an explosion in mobility. Because this is not DNA, this is isotope analysis on teeth. We can see how much people have been moving. Mm -hmm. And we also see on the boat types, suddenly you see the boat types in the south with these really animalistic boats that we later see in the Viking Age. Suddenly they appear up north in Norway, in the far north. And there's a lot of people forget this, but there was so much to trade up north, so which was valuable to people further south, especially sea mammals mm -hmm. like seal mm -hmm. and tusk. Tusk are really important, you know, ratatusk, that's tusk. Right. So, so like on, um, so, so we, we see a lot of things from different parts of the Eddas that we can place in that time period in the Nordic yeah. Bronze Age, which is really cool. Yeah, and what, and of course I come, that's why I love talking to you about this, because I come from it more, well, from a painter's perspective, so I see images, I see possibilities when it comes to motifs or, or, or yeah. metaphors. Um, but there's, uh, it struck me when I read through the, these two others that there's suddenly information that is amazingly concrete mm. for, uh, and, and uh, makes them really human. Mm. I mean, for, for example, this, uh, this um, uh, w one thing is, is the idea of, uh, is it that story with Odin and Loki, is it, who are caught, or Odin and Thor? And they have to barter and negotiate yeah. with this Jotun that, that has caught mm. them. Mm. And you're thinking, well, typically, of course, when you come from a Judeo-Christian background, you think, well, here's a, here's a god and a semi-god or whatever you could call Luke, being caught and they have to negotiate to be let free. Like, w what's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> but that seems to be reflective of an actual meeting between people. Is that absolutely, absolutely. You know, like with Thor, travels to Jotunheimen and meet the yeah. Jotunheimen who rule. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is, uh, Jotunheimen was not in the south of Norway where it is today, right? It was yeah. moved there. Uh, I think I mentioned this last time I was here. Yeah, for tourist reasons. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, it's not so far to travel. So, <laughs> so in the 1860s, we suddenly, there was a, you know, a, a sort of like spark of interest in mountain yeah. tourism. A lot of English nobility came over, aristocrats. To, to try and, and, and climb these uh, wonderful mountains, and they are more wonderful. You and I, we live both in these places uh, with lots of mountains around us. We see them every day, but for English, it's, it's magical, I guess. So they wanted a magical name, and, mm -hmm. they, and they put, we know who did it, Vinja, Osman Vinja. Oh. He put uh, Jotunheimen in the <laughs> south, but he was up north, and there was probably several Jotunheims in the sense it was a large area where there were glaciers, and yeah. we know about five glaciers up north in Finnmark, yeah. so maybe we can you know, pinpoint a little bit where it was. These are really old traditions about people who uh, had the advantage of the fair skin, which has to do with uh, D vitamin, right? Mm. And, and it creates then uh, a huge advantage for survival up north with the lack of sun, especially in the winter time. And, and they can follow the animals much easier. Um, 
in addition, they uh, of course uh, were were tall. We said, but actually, that was an advantage to be tall mm. when when covering huge distances. We see it even ten thousand years yeah. ago with the hunter gatherers. Uh, they could travel from the Caucasus to Estonia to Karelen, uh, and we see very similar DNA in all these huge areas. Uh, so we would think that larger people would need more energy to survive. It would be smart to be small when it's cold and really uh, in the outskirts of, of a known society in a sense, right? But it's the opposite. They had to travel huge distances. It's an advantage to have long legs. There was selection on people with long legs because that's then you're more suited to do what you need to do to get the animals mm. you need to get in order to survive. We know they were tall. There were these Eastern hunter-gatherers who merged and blended in and became the Scandinavian hunter-gatherers with the other Western hunter-gatherers. And, and there's a transition here of thousands of years. So, and then first the farmers come, these are the Vanir. And then the warriors come, these are the Asir. And then the Asir wants to go up to Jotunheimen. Maybe that was about 1600 BC, right? Why did it go? Well, this is, this, is, this is the most easy part. Because at this time in the Bronze Age, trade was so important. They had enormous trading networks all over Europe because of tin and because of copper, mm. because of bronze. And, the, and they had the mines for tin, was in Cornwall in England and, and, and other places, but that was the most important one. And the most important copper ore were in Austria. So in order to combine these things, you, you had archaeologists are talking about this pyramid uh, trading routes. Mm. You know, you would take amber from the Baltic, which was what our ancestors did. They would go down to this uh, tumulus culture in present day Hungary. And, uh, and uh, they would trade there with people further south and, and uh, they would get um, uh, copper there and they would go up towards England and get the tin there and they would trade all along because amber was so valuable or the tusk or the seal or the, um, uh, even, even feather from, from these birds. You know, Scandinavians we used to have the most beautiful beds. And, and pillows anywhere, you know. If people from Greece came up to Norway and, and got to sleep there 3,500 years ago, mm. you, would, you would feel like they slept <laughs> in, in the heavens, you know. Uh, because of, uh, we have this special bird, we still have it though, yeah. but it was in, we see it in the Viking Age. It was yeah. one of the most uh, important uh, trading uh, materials or, or goods that they had. Yeah. Feathers. Yeah. So, if if I understand you correctly, there is a case for that, uh, f in some way, well, for describing these as actual groups meeting each other. Because I I'm, I was thinking about this term, uh, uh, euhemerism. Yes. From Euhemeros, a Greek philosopher, third century uh, BC. before BC. Yeah. Mm. Uh, who, as I understand, I don't know if he launched it, but he's known for coined that. Coined it, I guess. Coined it, yeah. Oh, he could uh, coin it. It was from him. Yeah. Well, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so he talks about how the gods were actually um, people of high birth. Yeah. That came to be be uh, regarded as uh, divine for some reason, reason, and then they sort of were turned into gods. Yeah, and I was just uh, uh, because in, in an introduction to the Snorri Sedda that I have, um, he's talking about that that was uh, euhemerism was like, was a typical tool from the Christian perspective in the medieval ages to sort of to lessen the the potency of these stories because it was just superstition you know and it was just they were just just normal people they were just stories these things that we read about ah, okay but, but yeah. what you're saying now is that there there actually is yeah. DNA and other evidence for the fact that they were, were groups meeting each other yeah because what and that they were mythologized afterwards yes 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 because what we all also see is that uh, some of the later uh, rulers would try to claim heritage to the old gods yeah. in order to, led, 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 how do you say it in English, led, legitimate? Legitimize. Le legitimize, thanks. Yeah. Legitimize. <laughs> I need to drink some more of this. I guess oh. you're pouring, oh, right? Come yeah. on. <laughs> you need some more. But this concept has a name, it's called uh, Hieros Gamos. Oh, yes. Yeah. 
tell me about that. And, and that's, um, that's putting divinity in, are, are you not having? Are, are no, you no, I still have. Okay, okay, okay. Um, that's putting divinity into your own heritage to oh, proclaim yeah. or, or to um, uh, defend your right to rule. Mm. Um, and it's very typical for a new ruler from an unknown family, maybe, and that you want to, you know, connect. And that's why you have a lot of people intermarrying or intermarrying their daughters or doing these strategic um, um, weddings, I guess, or unions. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but thing is, these, a lot of these stories are more and more, the more we learn, they're based on real events and, and, and real people. And some people have maybe merged or, or turned into uh, other stories or, or blended in. That's probably why Odin has so many names, you know, far more than a hundred names, for example. That's one thing. And that I think it's also the, the case with, uh, is it said about Freya? Yeah. Who is a Vanir, and she's sort of the Aphrodite, I guess, of uh, of Norse mythology. Mm. That it says specifically that she had has many names, so that she can be recognized in many different cultures. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably yeah. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And and you know, I I kind of kind of like this because I mean we can trace these mythologies in different cultures backwards yeah. and we can see the similarities and now that we know where the different roots are you know like the indo-european roots are where they come from and you've got the agricultural roots coming in from the fertile crescent through present day turkey turkey mm. right um and then you have the hunter gatherers which are spread all over um europe uh, and then you have the Scandinavian hunter gatherers. So, so if if you know this, you can you can say, all right, uh, for the agriculturalists, uh, the the sun was much much more important than the pastoralists, who were the warriors. Mm. The warriors they followed the herd and controlled the animals. Um, so, so, so of course they had a different way of of um, worshiping. The sun was important to agriculturalists, of course, because you're so dependent on good. Uh, uh, you know, these natural um, variations in, 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 in climate, suddenly you have three yeah. bad years and you, you, you're so dependent because as in every warm, warming period, you have more food and then you have more people and suddenly have too much people when they have colder periods mm. and you don't have enough food and that's when trouble happens and this happens all the time, right now, for example. And, and, uh, and the, of course, they, we know fertility was very important to them, but it was a different kind of fertility than the hunter-gatherers, especially the Scandinavian hunter-gatherers. There's a study I read. Um, they would only have children every six years, about, mm -hmm. the Scandinavian hunter-gatherers, because it's so far up north, people forget how far north. It's in, it's in the Antarctic. It's in the Arctic, meaning Antarctica. Mm. If you turn the globes upside down, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so if you, if you were to have children and, and be sure that they were raised and everything, you had to be responsible and plan good and, and not have children every other year, you know, like you could in agric agricultural societies. So there's a different kind of fertility and we see it on the places of worship. Mm. The agriculturalists, they had all this stone that they needed to gather because they needed the farming land, right? So of course they built it, you know, smart and got these pyramids or the megaliths, uh, um, ornaments in, in a sense uh, for their ceremonies. While the hunter-gatherers, they had their places in nature. They didn't build anything, you know, they had their places and you can see mm. where the hunting is depicted and you can see other places where we see phallos and vulva and it's fertility, but a different kind of fertility. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there is that story from the older Edda about uh, what's her name? Is it Gida? Yeah. And and uh, mm. it's uh, it's Frey mm -hmm. who sees her from this. He sits in that seat. I think it's Odin's seat, isn't it? Where he can see all all over the world, and he sees her, and then he gets sick with with love or yeah. lust, lust yeah. for her, 
And then he sends his servant to negotiate and promise different things, like 11 golden apples yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and different things. And in the end, he says, well, if you don't do it, I'll, uh, we're going to kill you. Yeah. And she doesn't want to give in to pressure, but it, finally she, she does. And then they agree to meet. And that's where the, the, the story, sort of, the surface story becomes symbolic because they're supposed to meet in Bare, which is the name for barley. Yeah. So it seems to be more of a a, a, a uh, ritual or write about uh, about um, uh, having children. Yes, yes. But that's more the agricultural mm. approach to it. Mm. And that's as you say. It, now that we know all this, uh, if we then read the Eddas all over again, yeah. it's it's really refreshing. You know, it's exhilarating in a sense. It's it's exciting because then you can see, you know, you can see the different traces back in time. Mm. Uh, so uh, up until recently, it's been uh, very important to many academics to have these time periods separate. We don't see the Bronze Age and the Iron Age and the Viking Age uh, together. You know, they're separate. They're not the same people. Oh. We can't do that anymore. Uh, what is separating them is, is, is a discontinuity because of the catastrophes that happen, you know. But it's all the same. It's all connected. And that's kind of cool. That those, so those catastrophes have tricked us into seeing these uh, different uh, uh, well, periods yeah. as unconnected. Um, yeah. And it's only natural. I can understand mm. why. Because uh, the same thing happens before every disaster. Or great catastrophe. The same thing happens during every catastrophe. You know, lots of people dying, for example. But afterwards, when society is being rebuilt, mm. just like after Ragnarok, there is life. Um, then the same thing happens also after every disaster. Mm. And that is, for example, you get a new language or refined language. Uh, and you also get new trading routes. You get new blends of peoples. But you also get new technology. So that's why you had bronze and then you got iron. But iron comes from different sources and suddenly you had lots of iron in Scandinavia. So you didn't need to be part of these huge trading networks anymore, you know. So there's a whole new situation after the Nordic Bronze Age. And of course I understand when you don't know anything from just looking at the archaeological material that that's our, these are separate periods. But not when you look at DNA. Mm. And there's a woman's story here, a female story that's really, really cute because a, uh, several DNA studies actually see surprisingly stable genetic populations among women for thousands of years in the same area. Uh, for example, Gothic women uh, 1800 years ago are very similar genetically to Nordic Bronze Age women in the same area. And, and this is in, in northern Poland on the Baltic shore, but they're also very similar to southern Sweden. So it, it was the same society because of the amber. But you also see the same closeness in, in DNA in these women 1,000 years earlier, uh, before the arrival of the warriors. So that means you have Gothic women being very similar genetically to Nordic Bronze Age women, being very similar gen genetically to funnel beaker culture, as they're called. The Which is when? This is uh, 3,000 years ago, about, mm. before this... No, sorry, not 3,000, sorry. Um, 3,000 BC. So, so this is before the uh, event 4,200 years ago. Right. So it's 3000 BC, 5000 years ago. That's when you have the funnel beaker culture. That's when you had the arrival of the first warriors uh, and, and the war started, sort of. But we see genetically that these women are, are very similar to how they were 1000 years later and even 1700 years later. But the males change. Yeah, the males change. And that's, it's only logical. Who did all the warring? Who who did all the migration and the traveling and and the that's why the English uh, men were concerned with uh, the, their women were more attracted to the Vikings. <laughs> yes, yes, 
<laughs> says, well, it, it's, it's, it's history repeating itself, of course. Uh, yes. But uh, I'm interested, at, uh, what other signs are that, that, this, that these things manifest in the mythology? I mean, <clears throat> there's uh, well, one, one thing, uh, maybe you can answer this better than I can. For example, one thing that I noticed that suddenly became uh, repeated, that I saw repeated several places, was that Thor, he go goes east to fight with the Jotuns or the Trolls. Mm. And I'm thinking, what, what, is that significant of something that actually happened at a certain period? Or is, is like, why would they always go east and fight with the, the Trolls? Yeah. And, and the Jotuns, and, and uh, you know, uh, I guess you have to be in a region from the north to know how far east Norway actually goes. And, and, and one of the most important trading routes we've had oh, since the Viking Age okay. was north. But it's not north, it's east. Right, you just have to go uh, far so enough you, north. Not because I would think, okay, east that means uh, I don't know Turkey or. Oh no, no, no! Into present day Russia, yeah. right, the border of Finland in, mm. in that direction, because of rivers, right? Yeah. And we even have an old uh, one of the first one of the first written sources for the name Norway is is in uh, the ninth century from England at the court of King Alfred, mm. uh, where this. Um, um, Norwegian uh, sailor, trade, tradesman, had traveled up north and then east, and then he went s south down to what is called the White Sea in, in uh, Ladoga or close mm. to St. Petersburg. Mm. And he goes through there and comes into the Baltic and then to England, around Denmark and to England. And uh, so he went all this way around, far, far east, and then came back to England and, and to, to trade. Mm. Um, and, and it's a very, very good source that we have since it's written down at the court of uh, the royal court of uh, the King of England. Uh, so, so, yeah, um, I, what I'm starting to see right now because of these new, I mean, there's a lot of new DNA studies coming out from the East in present day Russia or, or Caucasus region or Kazakhstan or, but, but East. Uh, and and uh, and Poland and the Baltic states. Um, so what we see now more and more is that uh, there is a story. History has been told from a Western perspective, yes, but from a Western European perspective, focusing a lot on the British Isles and England, naturally. But there is a different story also emerging more and more about this Eastern path. And you mm. mentioned Attila and the Huns. Mm. We'll get to that. But, but because that's much later in history, right? But what we see is that because of the rivers going up and north uh, and, and south and, 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 and the way there's been, I mean, they traded. We find amber from the Baltic, which is 4,200 years old, about, or 4,000 years old, about, in Tbilisi in the Caucasus. They used them to bury their, their dead with, with gold and jewelry, and they had amber. Uh, 4,000 years ago, even right. then, right. they would trade on the rivers uh, eastwards, just like the Vikings did. Mm. And, and, and that's another thing that, that is also very clear, uh, speaking of trading, um, in the Edda, this thing about, uh, with that, uh, because we're talking about these large groups of people meeting, uh, the Asher and the Vanir and how they w they traded hostages. Mm. So some of the Vanir lived yeah. with the Asher and then the other way around. Yeah, yeah. It was very... Um, and, and even became leaders. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, it was very uh, normal, you know. We know this from many different places. And I think this is a, in the European way of both ruling uh, we see it in later times also, you would take hostages. Well, if you read the King's Saga, but Snorri is happening yeah. all the time. Yeah, and also the Romans would do that, you know. Ar Arminius, the guy who um, fooled three Roman legions in the year nine in the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest. Oh, yeah. Uh, he, he and his brother were raised, they were hostages, taking as small kids from a chieftain up north, Cheruski, I think they're called. And they were raised down in Rome, and good education, but they were raised to be uh, military commanders. 
It's such a and Armenius, story. he would he would uh, defect, yeah. while his his brother did not did not right. So, so there supposedly there is this after this big defeat a few years after, the two brothers are standing on, uh, the each shore of a river, looking at each other and talking, and one has a Roman, uh, armor and is uh, is dressed like a Roman soldier and he's a legionnaire and a captain or a general or something and his brother's on the other side and he's totally germanized and very germanic right and uh, and there uh, he's asking him to you know give up or give us that um uh, flag that you took from the romans you know it was very important uh, but but um that's probably just the depiction, but anyway, it's it's, mm. it's interesting. Mm. Mm. Yeah, we see hostages, lots of hostages. That was uh, it was normal. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and if this then, if the Asir came in and they, like you were saying about saying about uh, having horses and carriages, that because that, that's also a metaphor that is often used in the other yeah. about the horse and carriage mm. uh, pulling the sun, yeah. for example. And and they have this. Um, we know from two thousand years ago, Tacitus he wrote about this, or did he say Tacitus in English? I can't remember. Tacitus, Tacitus doesn't matter. He wrote about how um, the Ger Ger Germanic tribes would have these wagons and they would do these processions. We call them, where they would have big ceremonies with the wagon being dragged, and it was very spiritual. And very ancient and we know that with Natus, but this was with Njord, but we know it from the uh, Nordic Bronze Age also and we even have this mm -hmm. wagon in the Oseberg burial ship which is from the start of the Viking Age. Even then they had the same, so you can see these, the importance of wagons in ceremonies both in the start of the Viking Age, in the middle of the Roman Age and even in the Bronze Age. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was, um, it was a lot of symbolisms and the rituals were no doubt very, very important. But that, yeah, but that was also something that the um, Vanir then actually had before the Asir came. Probably, yes. It's oh, okay. a tradition so it, from the agricultural society, yes. Yeah. Especially with, with Nartus and Njord. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, agricultural. Uh, Maybe it has something to do with the sun worship, absolutely, because we have some, we have like this disc, which is the... Um, uh, from Denmark? Yes, uh, that uh, shows the stars and the moon and the sun, and, and uh, we also have a carriage dragging the sun or the moon uh, from uh, northern Germany, but it's part of the same culture and the same time period, this is the Bronze Age. Um, so we know the sun was uh, of vital importance. Mm. 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 But then it, it seems also that, that, this, uh, that there's one strange story about that's the marriage between, uh, is it, uh, that's Njord, right? And Skada. Yeah, yeah. And she, yeah. she is uh, some Jotner, likes to go sk skiing and yeah, hunting, I guess. Like, yeah. And he likes to live by the sea. And they can't, they basically divorce because they can't live together because they're, they are so used to two different landscapes. Yeah, yeah. And she that, was unhappy, Skada. Yeah, yeah. but that's, that seems to be a very uh, clear uh, um, reflection yeah. of these different groups again meeting, right? And she was. Um, she was going to be wedded away and she had to make a choice or she she was able to make a choice yeah. and she would she was told just look at the feet of these uh, warriors and she chose, chose the one with the most beautiful feet yeah uh, and that was Njord and it was a very unhappy marriage and she was hoping <laughs> for another man but uh, she mistook him for having uh, uh, ugly feet I guess yeah, yeah. It's really weird, but you know, all these uh, stories um, have, I mean, they're very wild in a sense, but now we can understand more about them. I think it's, it's, it's really cool. So it's not just uh, euhemerism, it actually has a root in reality. Some do, no yeah. doubt, mm -hmm. yeah. And then you have some others, we see some Viking kings who 
suddenly became rich from going into Viking and coming back with lots and lots of gold as mercenaries and stuff. And then they just buy, use their wealth to buy their kingdom, right? And then they need to connect it to something, you know? They can marry a queen mm. and have children and heirs, or, or they can do something more, you know, with their storytelling. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Is there anything else we should talk about? Well, um, I mean, this is a good start because now we've talked, we've laid out the landscape for the um, Eddas, the way Snorre wrote about them. And, and we've, I guess, proposed that a lot of it is based on real events. We're starting now to see how these events played out. We can see genetically, like this uh, Danish professor I used to work with, uh, is a geneticist. He said that the, this is from the Viking study, that you can see from the DNA that a lot of Norwegians have DNA that looked like Stone Age DNA, you know, like, like hunter gatherers. Meaning stable DNA for a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that, yeah. yeah. But the thing is, uh, it's old. Yeah. And, and, and if it has been like with the Beaker culture in the, in the British Isles, uh, that, then you wouldn't have seen anything of that, you know. Yeah. But this all has to do with geography and survival, you know. To survive that far up north, to have that hostile environment, and even to thrive, mm. that created a sort of... Uh, a, a level of adaptation, which I still, I think still is beneficial to us today. Mm. Of course, there's a lot of conformity to it also. I think everyone as a society had to walk in line and uh, plan the same way. But there's also that very strange individualism. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. that I, I think, I guess we yeah. talked about in the interview I did with you, and this thing about that we won't, won't just accept to be Christ, Christian. Yeah. We have to discuss this, for example. Or this, uh, this, uh, these three people who want to join uh, all of the holy, as it's yeah. called, yeah. to fight. And he asks, well, are you a Christians or a heathens? And they say, we are neither Christians nor heathen. But yeah. We believe in our own abilities and to cope with the challenges that we face. And you have to talk uh, with all of us. Yeah, yeah, not yeah. just one. Yeah. We don't have one leader, right? Right. right? So, so, but, but, uh, I think this is a very interesting aspect of Scandinavian society. We have it in our old or ancient law texts, texts which were orally transmitted, not uh, not written down until much later, uh, where where you had the right to throw away your king yes. if you weren't happy with it. The yes. nobility could use yeah. this. They took this with them down to Normandy when they settled there, the Vikings. But even in Sweden, they, they have done it up until recent times. Mm -hmm. in, in 1809, I think, or 10, the Swedes elected that their uh, rightful uh, king uh, was not to be king anymore. And they chose a French general, uh, Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte, to be their king. And he changed his name to King Carl Johan. And still today, it's his descendants who are the kings and queens of uh, Sweden. So, so this is an ancient tradition uh, and it's part of that individualism. I think maybe you have to have these kind of rules if uh, some rulers go wrong because it's so harsh. So if you make a critical error, everyone can die. Yeah. So you can't make those mistakes. <clears throat> so you have to have some kind of, uh, you know, you need to pull and... Uh, uh, some car, uh, some stop, uh, like on the train, and say, "Hey, hey, we can't do this." Emergency brakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. something like that. You know, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's interesting. It's it's nice. We can continue on this in the next episode. I'm sure. Hmm. Definitely, we'll get into uh, because that's that's uh, uh, that's one one thing. Yeah, for the next episode, that this is a mythology where. If I understand it correctly, the gods, they don't create their world. They come into it when it's created. And uh, I want to talk about that yeah, in our next episode and see sure. what, what kind of implications does that have. Yeah, that's interesting. Let's, yeah. let's start there. That's cool. <laughs>